What's up, Discovery? How's everybody doing today? Woo! Man, it's so good to see your beautiful faces today. How many of you have been enjoying this series, Relationships Uncensored? Yeah? yeah? How, how many of you, by show of hands, how many of you have been out to week one or week two? Woo! Look at you brave souls coming back for more abuse. <laughs> so awesome, so exciting. Man, it's been such a great series. Pastor Jason has done such a fantastic job in first week and week one and week two of this series, just really unpacking some, some deep relational truths. If you missed it, please go out to our website, ilovediscovery.church, and check it out. Uh, they're fantastic, fantastic uh, messages, week one, week two. And we're in week three. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Pastor Todd Howard, and I'm one of the associates here at Discovery Church. And I'm going to be bringing week three today, this message uh, this morning. And so I just need your help. Just pretend that uh, I have almost as epic of a beard as Pastor Jason. <laughs> And, and we'll be fine today. Uh, so we've talked about some different things over these uh, last three weeks. Today we're going to be talking about marriage. And, and before you, you tune me out or, or shut me off, uh, let me explain a little bit about the message. Uh, if you're single and you're not married, if you're married, if you used to be married, uh, if you're somewhere in the mix of all of that, there are going to be some truths from, from the God's word that can apply to you and to your relationships, uh, friendships, family, uh, work relationships. We're going to be looking at some things that we can take some principles from God's word to make our relationships better. But the theme really is going to be about marriage. Uh, I've been married for almost 27 years to my beautiful wife, Pastor Alicia. And yeah, she's, she's awesome. Uh, notice that I didn't say that I've been happily married for 27 years. I said I've been married for 27 years. Because anybody that tells you they've been happily married for 27 or 30 years, they're a liar. Uh, I'm, I'm happily married today to my beautiful wife. Uh, I, I've been happily married most of our marriage, and so has she, but, but you know, relationships are hard. They're difficult. Marriages is, are tough. You're, you're adding people into a mix of your life and trying to figure it out and compromise together or not compromise, and, and no, no marriage is 50-50. Uh, some are 60-40, some are 70-30, but, but no marriage is 50-50, no matter how much we want to proclaim that, and so we can have all these emotions when we talk about relationships and marriage. Uh, but I, I want us to really focus on one thing today as we move forward, and that's our theme verse for today, which is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, and it says these words. It says, most important of all, and remember this as we're moving forward today, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. So we're going we're gonna to operate in love today, but what we're not going to do is we're not going to point and jab, and, and, and even one of the worst things we can do is compare our marriage to someone else's marriage, right? So I'm not going to get up here and tell you what Pastor Alicia and I do to make it work and that you should do that because you're different than I am. You're a different person. You're different than my wife, and so we don't want to compare. Matter of fact, I heard this story years ago. There's this young newlywed couple, and they were struggling in their marriage, and they were fighting a lot, and they were at a, an anniversary party for this couple that was celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And that's, that's a long time. That's a long time to be married. Very impressive. And, and the young man went to the, to the older gentleman. And he said, sir, you guys have been married for 50 years. I've never seen you fight. I've never seen you argue. You guys seem so happy and content. What is the secret to your happy marriage? And he said, well, he said, it started on our wedding day. He said, understand this was a long time ago when we weren't wealthy, so we didn't have a car, and we didn't go to some foreign land for a, for a, a lavish honeymoon. Uh, we actually left on horseback, and we went to a little cottage. And so after our wedding ceremony, we each climbed on our horse. We had two horses, and we rode down the road. And a couple miles down the road, my wife's horse just locked up, stopped moving. And I watched her in her wedding dress. She climbed up off the horse, and she walked around in front of the horse, and she looked the horse dead in the eye, and she said, that's one. I thought that was strange, but then she walks around, climbs back on the horse, gives it a little kick, and the horse begins to move again. 
I said, all right, so let's keep moving. So sure enough, a few miles down the road, as we're traveling, her horse just locks up again. Won't move. She kicks it. She, she, she whips the reins a little bit. The horse won't move. She climbs back off the horse in her wedding dress and walks around to the front of the horse, and she looks the horse dead in the eye, and she said, that's two. Then she comes around. She gets back on the horse, and she begins to go forward, and sure enough, the horse begins to go with her, and he goes, I thought that was really strange. I didn't know, and we're almost to our honeymoon cottage destination, and sure enough, a third time, the horse locks up and stops dead in the tracks, and I thought, well, here we go again. She climbs up off the horse on her wedding dress. She walks around, looks the horse dead in the eye, pulls the gun out, and shoots it dead. <laughs> the young man was shocked. He said, what, what did you do? He said, I was shocked. He said, he said, I said, hey, hey, you can't do that. He said, my wife looked me dead in the eye, and she said, that's one. We've never fought since then. <laughs> See, the, the secret to your happy marriage and my happy marriage might be different, right? We, we can't compare to other people because we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. So what we have to do is we have to, to look at what society says about relationships and what God says about relationships and where they intersect and where they separate. And so I want to show you some statistics. A uh, Pew Research Center, which is a famous research uh, company, came out with a, uh, a study on Valentine's Day of this year. Great day to come out with a study on marriage. Valentine's Day of this year that happened in the summer of last year. I just want to show you some statistics about marriage. Marriages, lifelong marriages, have declined 72% since the 1960s. Lifelong marriages have declined by 72% since the 1960s. Right now, currently, only 20% of people in the U.S. believe that marriage is essential to their happiness. Only 20, 20%. Now, opposed to that, 30% of people believe that living together is essential to happiness. So more people believe that cohabitation is more beneficial than actual marriage. 60% of those people believe that their career is more essential to their happiness than their marriage. Isn't that crazy? And check this out. This one blew me away. 40% of people in their 30s or younger believe that marriage is completely obsolete. This is, this is what our society is saying about marriage. But is this what God says about marriage? And if it's not what God says about marriage, we have to look and see what God says about marriage and what God says about our relationships. Are we operating in God's plan or are we operating in the world's plan? And Pastor Jason did such a great job at the beginning of the year with a series called Better. And he has a book out in the lobby that's available for sale called Better. And he really talked about God's plan versus our plan and surrendering our lives to God. And I want to keep in that theme today of surrendering ourselves to God's plan. But the reality is with any relationships, friendships, family relationships, and definitely marriage, it's hard. It's hard to always get along. It's hard to find common ground. And what happens is, is we get sucked into something I want to call the whirlwind of life that just begins to suck us in and it pulls us off course if we're not careful. And I, I want us to identify that today and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says these words about God's plan versus our plan and being sucked into the whirlwind. He said, you're still controlled by your sinful nature. So we're wondering why our, our relationships aren't working or why we're struggling so much in our relationships. It's because a lot of times we haven't surrendered them to God. We're still trying to do it our way or society's way. And we're measuring our life against society rather than measuring against God's word. And so Paul says, hey, you're controlled by the society. You're controlled by your sinful nature. You're controlled by the world. You're jealous of one another and you quarrel with each other. And he says this, he says, doesn't that prove because you're jealous and you're fighting and you're bickering and it's not working, doesn't that prove that you're still controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? In other words, are, are you measuring your relationships, your friendships, your marriages against society's standards and trying to do everything you see on social media or everything you see on television or everything you read? Or are you measuring it according to God's standard for how we're to treat one another? And when we don't measure to God's standard, we get easily sucked into this whirlwind. Whether we're Christian or not, whether we're a follower of Christ or not, whether we attend church on a regular basis or not, it's so easy to get sucked into the whirlwind. I want to show you just a few things that happen in relationships that create just this, this whirlwind effect. And the first one, this is a fill-in for your notes, is distance. This is the first warning sign 
that we are on the wrong path is we begin to have distance, right? We, we begin to separate from one another. There begins to be some distance. When, when Pastor Alicia and I got married, man, we had a queen bed, and I think it was a hand-me-down probably from somebody, and, uh, and, and you know, you people don't know that today, but years ago, you used to get used furniture when you first got married. You didn't, couldn't go out and buy all your new furniture and all that good stuff. And so we, I think it was a handy down. I was like, man, we will never have a bigger bed than a queen bed. Honey, I just want to snuggle and cuddle with you, and this is it. And like 15 years into our marriage, we stayed at somebody's house, and we were on a California king. And I said, what is this magical place? Look at all this room. And we immediately bought a king bed because like, this is magical. We can visit each other, and then we can go to our separate corners. This is great. But distance, unhealthy distance, you have to be careful about it. It's so easy. We get so busy, right? We get busy with our jobs, our careers. We get busy with the kids and taking them to their seven practices and their science project fairs and all the things that they do. And we find ourselves just slowly drifting apart from one another. And when, when distance happens, we begin to have some of our own territory. And so what we do is we begin to build walls, begin to put walls up. And, and this becomes our space right? And that becomes their space. Now it's east versus west, and, and, and we have territory. No longer are we together. We share everything. We've made us one. Come on. No, we're, we've got separation and territory. And these, these are the things that I do and I like, and don't touch me, don't cross the barrier, and there becomes walls. So there's distance and then walls, and we find ourselves getting sucked into the whirlwind. And unfortunately, what happens is once we have our own territory and, and there begins to build, build some walls up, it escalates. It escalates into just negative thinking. It escalates into being separate all the time. It escalates into we're, we're existing together, but we're not living in unity. We, we have a schedule where we take care of the kids, where we go to work, where we make sure dinner's done. We, we can even ride in the same car together on Sunday morning, but there's separation and there's distance and there's walls. And so we ride in silence. Maybe you came today in silence because there's distance and walls and it's escalated now to now you know how to get back and what happens when we build up walls and it escalates this fourth thing happens we begin to incorporate false belief and what i mean by that is we begin to fill in the narrative of one another so we, we have distance and we have separation and we've built up walls and barriers between each other and it's not as easy as it once was to have a conversation and so then we begin to fill in the narrative that's what he's thinking that's what she's thinking that's what you meant by this what did you mean by that remark and we're always looking for the hidden meaning and and we allow ourselves to begin to fill in the narrative and this is where satan comes in this is where the devil says this is my playground when you get in your own mind and you start playing out the movie and falling victim to your imagination, the enemy comes in and he starts planting seeds. What are they doing there? How come they're late from work? What's happening there? What do they mean by that? How come I, they, they hid their phone from me? How come they said these things? They used to like these genes, now they don't. And all these things begin to take place in our minds and we have a false belief system. And what happens from there, the way it escalates, it becomes hostile. Hostility takes place. And it gets to a place where we're so volatile and so venomous that we can't even look at each other without breaking into a fight. And it starts with money and careers and the kids and it just begins to escalate until it just, the well of your love is poisoned so much that you just spew venom. You don't mean to, but you just do it and you don't want to and you regret it, but it comes out and everything you say and do to where it gets to a bubbling point, a boiling point to where you can't even talk about the groceries without getting into a fight. And the reality is, is that no one got married thinking they were going to wind up there. Nobody said I do with the idea of divorce. Nobody fell in love with planning to get out of love. But yet it happens, this whirlwind takes place and it sucks us offline and we find ourselves so far from where we originally intended to be. And here's the thing, it doesn't happen all at once. Because when you're in love and you're in unity and you're, you're best friends and, and everything is great and, and man, you're in that honeymoon phase, whether that's six months or 16 years or 27 years, come on somebody. No matter, no matter where you at, baby, yeah, come on. Uh, no matter where you at in that, you know, if you missed week one, you need to listen to week one, all right? That's all I'm saying. All right. 
no matter where you're at in that, you have to understand that you didn't get there overnight. And when you're, when you're in love like that, you can face the big things. But it's the little things that we let go that begin to grow in our lives. I love what Solomon said in Song of Songs, in chapter 2 of, of Song of Songs. He says these words, he says, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. See, there's a, there's a principle there. It's the little things, right? It's the little things that we, oh, that's, that's nothing. We'll just let that go. That's, that's not a big deal. It's fine. And we let the little things slide, and slowly but surely, the little things will begin to ruin our vineyards. He said, our vineyards that are in bloom. See, what happens is we're deep in love, and we begin to let the little things go in our lives, and what happens is it begins to corrupt who we are, begins to corrupt our relationships and how we value one another. So we have to be mindful of the little things because one day we wake up and we say we've fallen out of love. But that's not the reality. The reality is that we don't fall out of love. We stop practicing love. So you can fall in love because there's, there's just these natural reactions. We're attracted to symmetry and, and personality and love at first sight. I absolutely believe that. It may not be deep love, but, but there's initial attraction and then it becomes love and that happens pretty quickly. But we don't fall out of love overnight. What happens is we don't mind the little things. We stop practicing love on a regular basis. I love this quote that I read this week. It says, a successful marriage requires falling in love many times over and over again to the same person. Amen. So your yes has to be yes today. It has to be yes tomorrow. It has to be yes next week. It's not that you said yes one time and that's forever because it doesn't work that way. We must continue to say yes in our relationships. We must continue to say yes in our friendships. We must continue to say yes to God and yes to our marriages. It is a gradual process that we stay in love. Amen? Amen. We know that. You know that. Preaching to the choir, right? Why is it so hard then? If we know that to be true, why is it so hard? And, and the reality is, is that we're just different. I, I love Dr. Emerson Agritz. He, he talks about this. He's talked about it for years. He said, women see with pink sunglasses and they hear with pink hearing aids and they speak with pink megaphones. He said, and men, they see with blue sunglasses, and they hear with blue hearing aids, and they speak with blue megaphones. And he said, so what we see is different, our perspectives. What we hear is often different, and what we say is often different, because we're different. And so I want to show you, one of the reasons it's so hard is, I want to show you a couple things here. One of the things is that men are hunters, and women are hinters. <laughs> we're different. We are different. I'll give you an example. You're driving down the road with your wife, and she's looking out the other window, and it's like Iceland in the car, and you say, honey, what's wrong? Are you okay? And she says, nothing. <laughs> you know something's wrong. And ladies, you're thinking, you know exactly what you did. You better apologize. You better, you know what, what's going on. Don't pretend like you don't. Can I just tell you, we don't. <laughs> We're dumb. We, we don't know what's wrong. If you would tell us, we would try to hunt it down and kill it because we just don't know. And so then we're like, my God, is it our anniversary? What would I say? What, did I not compliment? What I forget? And we're trying to figure it out, but we're dumb. We don't know. We're hunters. We, we hunt, we kill, we bring it home. We don't know anything else. And you're hinting. And we're saying those different things. We don't hear the same way. The second thing is that men are solvers and women are censors. This is why you need to tell us what's wrong, because we want to fix it if we can. But here's the thing. Women, you're, you're intuitive, and you have, you have great discernment, and, and you, you feel things. You sense things. You, you know what's going on in people's lives. We are oblivious to that. Okay? We, we, we don't know. And so when you tell us things that we can't fix, it wrecks us. Stop telling us things that we cannot solve. Tell your friends. You, you have to understand how hard it is as a man to hear a problem that is not fixable because we're hunters and solvers. We want to fix it. And so when you say, I just need you to hear me, that's like saying, honey, I need you to go through waterboarding today. 
And so, men, we got to listen, all right? We, it's not a, we got to listen, but you got to concentrate sometimes and think, I am going to hear this story, and I'm going to pay attention. I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm not going to wander off. I'm not going to think about what I'm saying next. I'm going to listen to this story that I can do nothing about <laughs> because I love my wife, because she's feeling some things. She's sensing something. She's working some things out, and because we're partners, and the hard thing about that is that men are tight-lipped and women are talkers. Men like bullet points, highlights, sports center. Women love to tell the details. My wife can tell you what everyone the first day of her second grade class was wearing. This is information no one needs. But she has these details in her mind that I do not keep in mind. I am a bullet point guy. It's how I operate. And so we're like a well of mystery. And ladies, you think because we're not talking, we have all this stuff going on on the inside of us. And when you ask us what we're thinking, we say nothing. And you feel like we're not communicating. But we're really not thinking anything. <laughs> it's, that's the truth. We did all of our thinking already. We've come home to not think. It's how we work. It's, it's, I'm not, these, I know these are generalizations and it's not 100% for everybody, but the reality is, is that men and women operate on a different level. They do. But yet God looked at Adam and he said, man, it's not good for man to be alone. Now, if I can just be candid with you, he didn't say that about Eve. It's, it's rough. Because we're different, it's hard sometimes. And it creates this whirlwind because we don't decipher each other pr properly. There's love, but there's not always good communication. And so it becomes hard. And there's a whirlwind that we get sucked into. And then there's distance. And then there's walls. And there's escalation. And then there's filling in the narrative of false belief. And then there's hostility and venom. And we don't know how to get back to where we were because we feel like we've strayed so far and wonder how we got there. Like all those little things built up into such big things and how we got there. And I love Proverbs 17, 4. It says, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam, right? Starting an argument is like breaking a dam. Can you see that in your mind? A dam holding back the waters over a valley. Starting an argument is like breaking a dam. And so when we say the wrong things and we do the wrong things and we know we shouldn't, but we're going to say it because we want to hit that nerve because there's hostility, because there's anger, because there's separation, because we've built up walls and it's East versus West and the Cold War is happening and, and we, 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 we're not where we used to be. We regret it afterwards, but we just can't seem to help ourselves and we, we break the dam and the waters flow and things are said that can't be taken back. Things are done that we regret, and it's so hard. And so, so the Bible says it's like breaking a dam. He said, so stop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Don't say what you're thinking. It doesn't have to come out of your mouth every time. Right. Amen. And so I want to give you just five quick things that you can do. And today, wherever you're at in your relationships, friendships, marriages, wherever, if you're feeling that separation with someone, you're feeling that distance or that hostility, maybe there's venom in your heart towards a family member or in your marriage and, and you need God to do something, but you feel so separated, you don't know how to get back to, to, to square one on it. You don't have to do all five of these things today, but if you could just work on one, then maybe next week or next month, work on the next one. And, and let God take you through some baby steps. But the first thing that we have to do, number one, is guard our hearts. Guard our hearts. In other words, it starts with us, is what I'm saying. You cannot fix that other person. Amen. Ladies, it was cute when you were dating, and he had all that free time because he wasn't working, and now you're mad because he won't hold a job. He did not change. You just overlooked it. You cannot fix him. Men, you cannot fix your lady. You can only fix yourself. And so it starts with heart. One of the things that, that I hate is the mall. And, and uh, I knew I'd get a shout down there. And what's beautiful about my marriage is that my wife, Pastor Alicia, also despises the mall. And, and so it's like win-win. And, 
And so the reality is, though, sometimes we have to go to the mall. And so for Christmas, we had to go to the mall. And uh, to pick up a couple things we could only get at this, this Spawn of Satan mall. And so, uh, <laughs> so we go. We go to the mall, and we think we know where the store's at. Um, but we're not sure, so we park next to the department store, and we go into the entrance, and we go in, and we think we're really close to where we were supposed to be, and we're looking for the directory, and there's lots of people, and we go to the directory, and it's an advertisement, not a directory, and then we go to another one's an advertisement, and we go finally find one that's a directory that's forever away, and we're looking, we're looking, we're looking, and we find the little red bubble, and it says, you are here. I'm like, okay. So then we find the store, and they're like, okay, uh, uh, up the escalator, around the corner, out the parking lot, down the street. There's where our store is. And I was like, dang it. We came in the wrong side. And we had to traverse the entire mall with all these Christmas shoppers in order to get where we needed to go. Because you weren't going to find another parking space, so that, you're just stuck. That's where you were. But the, but the reality is, we could never find the store until we knew where we were at. Right? You have to know where you're at. And so if you find yourself distant or with walls or maybe even venomous and hostile today, the first place to start is where you're at. Guard your heart. It starts with us. I love what David wrote in Psalms 51.10. He he wrote these words, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. David penned these words when he was king. After he had had an affair with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, and to cover it up, murdered her husband. This is David. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. But David did these things. He was supposed to be at war with his soldiers. Instead, he stayed home, and then he went out on the rooftop during the bathing time and was looking out on the roofs, and he saw Bathsheba, and she was gorgeous, and he took her. And then he murdered her husband to cover it up. And God sent the prophet Nathan to expose him, and David repented. But he knew that he had done wrong and he had violated not only Bathsheba and her husband, not only uh, his rulership and his leadership, he, he had violated God's purpose and plan for his life. And so then he penned these words, create in me a clean heart. Amen. Renew in me, God, who I once was, Lord, because I don't want to be the person I am today. It starts with our heart. When there's distance and walls have come up, we have to start with God and say, God, Tear those walls down. Tear those walls down. Build a bridge back to you, God. That's where we start. The second thing we do is that we manage our thoughts. We manage our thoughts. This is so important. Not only do we guard our heart, but we also manage the things that we think. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, we can demolish every deceptive fantasy. Because here's what happens is when we have distance and then walls come up and then then we have false belief that comes in, we're we're not managing our thought life very well because we're filling in the narrative. And so there's these deceptive fantasies that come in. And so when we're not being satisfied in our relationships and our marriages, we'll start fantasizing about other relationships and other marriages and we go online or we fantasize about coworkers or friends and we allow these things to take place in our mind. We fantasize about just being separated or all these things take place. And, and And Paul says we can demolish all of those deceptive fantasies that oppose God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised in defiance of the true knowledge of God. And I love this next part. He says, we capture, like prisoners of war, we capture every thought and we insist that it bow down in obedience to God. He said, we have to be militant about our thought life. And I, I love Pastor Jason, a few weeks ago, he said these words. He said, we're not responsible for every thought that comes into our mind, but we are responsible for the action that we take about it. Amen. And I love that. It was so liberating because we're bombarded with so much information day in and day out that we have crazy thoughts that come into our head all the time. I was just sharing with my wife this morning. I had a weird dream this morning that I, that I cussed while I was preaching this morning on the stage. And I woke up, I thought, oh, don't do that. And... And I was like, where did that thought come from? And I thought, Lord, do I need to clean up my mouth? What's happening? I, but Lord, don't let me do that. And, and I was nervous about it. And I told her, I said, hey, I don't want to do this. I'm, and I had this dream. And, and we're not responsible for every single thought that comes into our mind. But we are responsible whether or not we act on it. So I'm not going to cuss this morning, okay? <laughs> Yet. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We take captive of those thoughts. We manage our thoughts. In other words, we examine them. We assess them. 
Is this a thought that we want to give place to in our life? Or is it something that we need to exit out and forget about? We have to take captive. I, I love this. If not, there's this escalation that takes place in our minds because we start filling in the narrative. And so I love what, what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5. He said that we need to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And what that means is to be aware of your surroundings, to walk intentionally and accurately, to be cautious, of check your, watch your six, to, to, to make sure that you are being cautious and careful. In other words, we're not flirting with somebody at the office because we're not happy at home. You know, people used to make fun of me because I would not go to lunch during, at work with someone of the opposite sex uh, when I was engaged to get married and after I got married. Uh, and they would make fun of me. And I would say, well, it's not about me. It's about protecting my marriage, Amen. keeping it sacred. And so, so I didn't even want that narrative to be out there. And I'm not saying you have to do that, but I'm just saying I was walking circumspectly. I was cautious and careful because I did not want to, tr to, to trip and fall into a pit and find myself distant and separated. So we have to be mindful of our surroundings, be, be careful and, and intentional, and walk circumspectly so there's not an escalation. And if we do these things, if we, if we guard our heart and we begin to manage our thoughts, then we can move to the next phase of healing our relationships, and that's number three, seeking to understand. Seeking to understand is so crucial. You know, I talked about the pink sunglasses and the blue sunglasses and that analogy of just saying and hearing things different. I'm, I'm going to give you an example. Ladies, when you say I have nothing to wear, <laughs> I think most of you, what you mean is you don't have anything new or you don't have anything event appropriate to wear. Men, when we say we have nothing to wear, what we mean is we have nothing clean. <laughs> so, Understand it's the exact same sentence. I have nothing to wear. Two completely different meanings. Isn't that interesting? The exact same words being so spoken, two completely different meanings. And so we have to seek to understand because even though we might be saying the same things, we may not mean the same things. And so there has to be an intentional seek to understand. I love what James, the brother of Jesus, he gives an uncensored look at relationships and he said, let everyone be quick to hear. This is the amplified version because I wanted to read these brackets. Let everyone be quick to hear. Be a careful, thoughtful listener. Intentional listener. For us guys, that's hard. And so you, you have to concentrate. You have to intentionally look your wife in the eye and listen to her story. And I'm going to give you something practical. Say something back to her that she said. Not so that you can... She, she'll, be tricked and that you won't be listening so that you'll remember what she said. Because it's hard for guys. We're, we're, we're not detail-oriented, but we need to be quick to hear. Let our ear be attentive to one another so that we can seek to understand. And then this next one's so important. While we're hearing, we have to be slow to speak. In other words, don't be thinking of what you're going to say in rebuttal to what was just said before they get done saying it. Amen, pastor. Oof. And speak carefully chosen words. In other words, use a filter. Don't say everything that comes into your mind. Even to your spouse, you don't have to say everything that comes into your mind. What happens when we, we're quick to hear and we're slow to speak, we become slow to anger. So we're not going to get defensive. We're not going to get angry. We're not going to put up walls. We're going to be patient. We're going to be reflective. And we're going to be forgiving. We're going to take a minute and just hear and dialogue, and have a good conversation. Why? Because we're seeking to understand. You have to ask yourself in these conversations where emotions get high and things begin to escalate, you need to stop and ask yourself, what do I want out of this conversation? Because if I want to just prove my point and be right, then we're never going to breach the gap. Amen. But if I want to seek to understand and find some common ground, because that's really what marriage is. It's not 50-50, but there is common ground to be had. If I want to do that, then, then all of a sudden I can de-escalate my emotions and logically step back into a conversation and seek to really understand the other person. It's so important. I love this quote from Elizabeth Gilbert. She wrote, Eat, Pray, Love, and she was staunch against marriage, and then she's actually got remarried in the last few years, and she wrote another book, called Committed, a Skeptic Makes Peace with Marriage. And she wrote these words, which I thought were so amazing about understanding. She said, to be fully seen by somebody and then to be loved anyway 
This is a human offering that can border on the miraculous. See, that's what understanding is. It's fully seeing someone and loving them anyway. It's like God sees us. He, he fully sees us. He knows all of our faults, all of our failures, all of our shortcomings, but yet he loves us so passionately and intimately regardless. And that's what we need to seek to do as, as relational people in marriage and friendships is to have that Christ-like love where we love each other regardless of our morning breath, regardless <laughs> of the shoes being left by the couch, regardless of the food being left out, whatever it is that has been magnified that's really not that important. And so when we seek to understand, then we can move on to this fourth thing, which is to speak words of life, to be intentional about our words, to speak things that bring life and don't tear down. Don't breach the dam with your words, but speak words of life. Don't let your words be uncensored. Let your relationships be uncensored. Amen. And I, I love... What the proverb says in 1624, pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Man, let your words be sweet. I, my, one of my favorite movies of all time is Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka. And he has this quote in, in, in the movie, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words hurt most of all. I love that quote because here's the reality is you can ask forgiveness, but you can't unsay what you said. You can forgive, but you can't unhear what you heard. It's so much easier to, to get toothpaste out of the tube than it is to put it back in, isn't it? And so when we allow hostility and volatility and venomous words and that well of love is poison and we just spew and we say things that maybe we don't mean and we cannot take those things back. They cannot be undone. They can be forgiven God can extend grace, but we cannot undo those things. So what will you say? What are your words bringing into your relationships? Proverbs 18.4 says it like this. It says, a person's words can be life-giving water. It can be life-giving water. Words of true wisdom are as refreshing as a bubbling brook. Are the things we say, are they life-giving are they bringing life? Are they, are they refreshing or are they tearing down? Are they destructive? Are they creating more and more of the whirlwind effect? Dr. Carolyn Leaf shared this acronym on social media this week. She's going to be one of our speakers at Brave this year, and I'm really super excited about it. Ladies, I'm coming to Brave. I'm going to be there because I love Dr. Carolyn Leaf, so I'm going to be there with you, ladies, and cheering. I'm going to get a Brave sweatshirt, all that good stuff. I love those sweatshirts. They're super soft. Uh, this is such a great acronym for us all to, to hold on to, though. It's, it's called THINK. And this is something that we should all ask ourselves before we say words. So important. Think before you speak. Ask yourself, number one, is it true? Is what I'm getting ready to say true? Or is it because I'm angry? Is it helpful? Is what I'm getting ready to say, is it going to bring life? Or is it going to be destructive? Is it inspiring? Is what I'm getting ready to say, is it going to be uplifting or is it going to tear down? Is it necessary? Is this information your husband needs to know? Is this information your wife needs to know? Is this information your friend needs to know? Is this gossip or is this something necessary for the conversation? And then fifth and, and most, maybe most important of all, is it kind? Kind words are like sweet honey off the lips into the heart of the soul we can ask ourselves these things before we speak, man, our relationships will be so much better. Our marriages will be so much stronger. Our friendships will be so much bigger if we could just do that. But maybe you're here today and maybe, maybe you're thinking, how do I get back to that? Because there's distance and walls and escalation and false belief and hostility and accusations and it feels like I'm so far away from where I started. I don't know how to get back there. And this is where we have to start, is this fifth truth, and that is to ask for help. Amen. We have to ask for help. Yeah. And man, that's hard. That's hard because relationships are private. Right. Marriages are private. We, we have learned and taught and trained as a society and as churches to, to keep it behind closed doors. You can be one way at home and another way at church as long as it doesn't spill over. 
And that's not God's plan or God's way for our lives. So but let me bring some clarity to what asking for help means. Because you can, you can talk to me after church or reach out to me. Of, of course you can. You can fill out even a prayer request card and, and say, I need prayer, I need help. And th- those are all good things. But, but here at Discovery, we're trying really hard to, to model ourselves after the New Testament church. And, and really where help and support come are in community. It's in our small groups. That's where you find support and help. That's where you find love and encouragement. It's in our community of small groups. And amazingly enough, this last year, 90% of the people that were in crisis that had nowhere to turn, that called the office or that we met with as pastors at Discovery, were not in community. People that were in community, they found help. They found support. They, they found life-giving. But, but people that were out of community, out of God's plan and design, did not have the help they needed. There's therapy, there's counseling, there's things that you can do, but the first step is humbling yourselves and asking for help. James, the brother of Jesus, said it like this. He said that God gives grace generously. He gives it freely. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's hard sometimes to be humble and say, God, I just, I need your help. I need your help. When we surrender our lives to God's plan. That's how we learn about grace. That's how we learn about forgiveness. That's how we learn about strength because our brothers and sisters come around us and they they support and they lift us up. Maybe you're in a whirlwind today in your marriage or in a friendship. Maybe you've been in a whirlwind with God. Maybe you feel distant from God and there's hostility and there's anger and there's resentment and there's walls built up and and you've kept God out of your heart and and you have feelings. Maybe you were hurt in the past. Maybe it didn't work out for you, whatever that is, but you feel that separation today and maybe it's time that you let down some walls. Maybe it's time that you ask for some help. Maybe it's time that you surrender to God's plan and not your plan. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. Close your eyes for just a moment.